Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here today. We're very fortunate to have Paul Durish, who's been with us all semester and will be with us for another month, Six weeks, yeah. month and a half, something wonderful like that. Uh, he's normally at home in the Department of Informatics at UC Irvine, and he'll be talking to us about a chapter from a forthcoming book about uh, the ways that software structures experience. That's sort of a gross statement of it, but we'll let you <laughs> fill in the blanks <laughs> okay. with what you really mean. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, so it's really it's it's um, really nice to be able to have this opportunity to uh, give this talk. So I've been here for a couple of months at this point. As Nancy said, this is the, the th I'm doing my sabbatical in different places this year, legs in different spots, and so this is the last leg of my sabbatical. Sometime about July 1st, I have to go home. <laughs> Just like have a little moment of silence as I think about that. Um, and most of what I've been doing during that time is working on um, a book manuscript. Um, and that, that has been a sort of project that's been brewing for a couple of years. And so what I want to do in the talk today is give you a little bit of an overview of what that project is and then use one particular example from it, um, which is one of, the, one of the chapters that focuses particularly on spreadsheets to try to exemplify what I'm, what I'm doing, in that, in doing in that work. Um, and the umbrella term that I've been using for that work is the materialities of information. That's not the title of the book, but it is the topic. Um, and so I feel I need to say a little bit about what the materialities of information might be, because after all, the sort of um, the, 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 if, there is, if there are two things that unify our sort of like conception and discourse of, um, about sort of contemporary digital experience, the first thing is that it's blue. Anytime you do any search for any of these kinds of slides, especially like big data slides, and it's all blue. I'm not quite sure why. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, it's like, you know, there's a, there's a question of maybe, maybe that's an alternative future that we haven't gotten to yet. That's a possibility as well. But, uh, but it's, it is very blue. But the second thing is that it's immaterial, right? That sort of fundamental notion about the digital is all this virtual immaterial stuff that we're freed from the bonds of the material world in terms of how information can move, how objects can move. We all know that in a certain sense, of course, that's not true. If, um, if software and digital stuff were entirely immaterial, I would be able to put as much of it on my phone as I want to, and we know that that's simply not true. Um, but the question is, in what other kinds of ways um, do, do, does the potential materiality or the materialities of information affect and shape what we do? and how we experience the digital world. So that's the reason that I've sort of been interested in this topic of the materialities of information. But if you sort of simply have that as an umbrella, there's a lot of different kinds of things that that can mean and weighs into it. We could look towards anthropology material culture to gain a sort of understanding of how it is that material objects carry value for us. They allow us to enact social relations. They have meaning for us in the things that we can do with them and in the ways in which they express solidarity, opposition, um, um, ritual practice, and so forth. They, they mean things to us. You could look towards geography, say, and think about the ways in which um, information is spread out in the world and not, again, uniformly, but there's information in certain places and you could argue, you know, in the early 21st century, your proximity to fiber optic cables is as important as your proximity to the freeway system was in the 20th century or the railway system in the 19th. I love this photograph, by the way. I should always acknowledge it was taken by Genevieve Bell somewhere in South Australia. There are many things to say about this photograph. It's unclear if this is an informational sign or a warning sign. I always point out to people the crazy, swervy tire tracks on the other side of the road. Um, uh, someone's like, no internet. <laughs> um, so again, sort of like thinking about that, but that's sort of like thinking about information infrastructures. We could um, think about the kinds of resource, mater material resources and other kinds of resources, um, uh, uh, human, um, um, organizational, economic, that need to be mustered and managed in order to produce digital experiences. That would be another way to think about sort of materialities. Or you could think about the ways in which the material shaping of information technology produces certain kinds of clusters and concentrations of power and control. Um, this building, One Wilshire in downtown Los Angeles, um, is one of the largest um, internet packet exchanges in the United States and therefore in the world. Um, 35 stories of server farm and, um, and, and network interconnects. Um, I actually, I go. Hmm? 
cables in the windows. Oh yeah, you know, I'd never noticed that. I hadn't blown it yeah. up before, but those are entirely like, that's like that's, that. They're, they're yeah, there's a lot there. Yeah. yeah, no, there's almost no people in this building, and of the small number of people who work in this building, several of them work for the National Security Administration. But uh, but but you know, otherwise otherwise it's all it's all computers and um, computers and network switches. I run through all these because these are not what I'm going to talk about when I want to talk about the materialities of information. Instead, um, my, my starting point is, um, is a, a quote from Donald Schoen, who was here at MIT, um, who talks about design as a reflexive conversation with materials. Um, and one of the questions you might want to ask then, if you believe that what we do with digital stuff is design, is to think about what are the materials with which we are having a reflexive conversation when we design in the digital realm? Or indeed, what are the materials with which we're having a reflexive conversation when we as users engage with the digital? What is it that speaks back to us? When you take Shun's quote, this sort of notion of reflexive conversation, what it produces, I think, or what it evokes is this iconic picture of, I don't know, something like this, the potter, um, with the clay on the wheel, um, attempting to produce through their direct engagement with materials some kind of uh, um, um, amalgam of what the materials will allow and what the artistic vision um, supports. So you want to do something and you sort of, you, you, you push on the world, the world pushes back, you discover through the ways you push on the world and it pushes back what it will accept, what it will do, what its possibilities are. That's the notion of material and material engagement I want to think about in the digital. I think that programmers, software designers, and indeed most of us as, as users of digital, digital systems have an understanding that, the, that, that those digital systems push back on us. Some things are easy, some things are hard. Some things fit naturally within the structures that the, comp that the computer system or the programming language or whatever it is offers. Other things do not. We need to sort of have a conversation. We need to push things around in order to try to find what the natural fit is between our conception and the possibilities of the digital, and that's the sense in which I want to sort of explore a question of the materialities of information. Um, people who study in HCI and cognitive science are very familiar with a whole series of examples of doing these things, not necessarily in the domain of the digital. One, of course, is um, our experience with sort of Indo-Arabic numeral systems in comparison to alternatives, right? It's very easy for me to do a, multipl uh, a complicated multiplication using Indo-Arabic numerals. We teach small children to do it, after all, because we have a positional system. We have structures that allow us to reduce problems to procedures. Um, therefore, and, and therefore to be able to carry out arithmetic operations. But when it comes to trying to do them in non-Indo-Arabic uh, systems and other kinds of systems, we discover that our procedures no longer work. The material form of the representation itself shapes what it is that we can do, we can act, how we can act, what we can do, how easily we can do it, and so forth. Um, so representational systems come with their own material properties. They are repurposable in different ways. They can be broken down into different kinds of pieces and reassembled. Um, some work has gone on, um, particularly in the area of sort of the psychology of programming languages, examining some of this with respect not to mathematical notations, but to computational notations. Um, so people like Thomas Green and Alan um, Blackwell and Marion Petrie have, uh, have written about what they call the cognitive dimensions of programming notations. Studying this particularly in the context of how people learn to program, how, how they learn to build systems, and arguing that the particular kinds of representational systems at work when we build computer systems, that is programming languages in their case, um, are, uh, produce uh, um, by dint of their, their representational properties different kinds of errors in programs. Things that are conceptually simple for us to talk about, adding a parameter to a method call or you know, reorganizing the, um, the layout of a data structure, turn themselves in different programming languages into more or less complicated tasks depending on the programming language. Some languages allow things to be expressed in any order, some don't. Some mean some require that a particular operation will touch many different lines of a programming of a program, whereas others will touch only one. Some require particular forms of consistency um, uh, through the program and so forth. And so they actually start to try to tease out 
the different kinds of properties that notations have as things that we have to sit in an editor and manipulate. And that's the sense in which I want to try and think about these things as material. They're material in the, in the ways in which um, uh, the, the, the concepts that we have in our head have to be realized through an engagement with the stuff that's on, that's on the screen. So that's sort of the broad focus that the, that the book work is taking. Um, and how it is I'm sort of conceptualizing this as, as the materialities of information. What I want to talk about to give it a little more um, meat today, perhaps, um, is one particular case study that, um, that gets developed in that book. And it's a case study that comes from some uh, ethnographic fieldwork that I and colleagues were engaged in a couple of years ago. Um, those of you uh, here at MSR who heard my whiteboard talk a few weeks ago heard me mention this. Um, but we did some research uh, at NASA studying the Cassini project, which is um, um, a, a spacecraft that's been flying since 2004. Um, well, it's been flying for longer than that, but since 2004 it has been flying around um, Saturn, the Saturn system. Um, and has been extended several times so that it's still there and, uh, next year. Next year the plan is they will uh, do the death spiral into the planet because they're running out of fuel. Um, but for most of, so you know, you talk about like flying spacecraft, it's pretty cool, but most of the time people are, it looks more like this. It looks less like the bridge of the Starship and Horizon, more like this. And in particular, what we noticed multiple times during our field work were meetings that were constructed specifically like this with a whole bunch of people sitting around a room facing a screen with like, you know, something projected on it, not entirely unlike what we're doing today, except that what was projected on the screen were not PowerPoint slides as usual, but spreadsheets. And so people were using spreadsheets as this organizational tool within their meetings. The spreadsheet was the focus of attention. The spreadsheet was the thing that was driving how the meeting was organized, not a standard, a standard slide presentation. Um, now, this is kind of, it was intriguing to us. Because, you know, if you think about the structure of that meeting, you know, people facing the screen, the projector, the computer, and the rest of it, there are a bunch of studies of those, but they tend to be studies of PowerPoint. They tend to be studies of people standing in front of the room uh, um, blabbing to slides. Um, last time I gave this talk, somebody took a picture of me as I had this slide up, and I was standing in the opposite <laughs> pose, actually. It's not quite the same one, but the opposite pose. And so I, I should have looked out that one, but it gets just a little too meta. Um, so this PowerPoint presentations and the structure of PowerPoint presentations and how PowerPoint structures interaction has been a topic for a number of scholars, including folk um, here in Cambridge. Um, so uh, Vondor Lukowski and Joanne Yates had uh, published some of the first work on the genres of organizational communication that are enabled um, or shaped by PowerPoint, what organizational communication looks like when it's all presented in the form of PowerPoint documents. Not necessarily, by the way, PowerPoint documents that are ever actually presented. There's at least one large organization I've worked with where almost all internal communication takes the form of a PowerPoint deck, including your perf annual performance appraisal, um, you know, project reports, and the rest of it all take the form of PowerPoint. So it's not just necessarily that it's at the front of the screen. Um, and um, and one, of, uh, one of Vonda's students, Sarah Kaplan, uh, um, study sort of the entwining of PowerPoint with, um, with organizational strategy um, processes and how it is that PowerPoint decks circulate and the, the, the granularity of objects and information in a PowerPoint deck becomes the granularity of which one can speak about organizational strategy, which when you think about it is just a frightening thing. Um, and then um, Her uh, Hubert Knobloch has got, done a really interesting set of sort of ethnomethodological studies of, how it, of, of, of what he calls PowerPoint events. So this is, he doesn't care about PowerPoint itself, and he doesn't care so much about the slide. What he cares about is the event. A set of people facing in this direction, a person standing at the front of the room pointing at things, trying to like, you know, look at his computer as well, all that. Like, how, how do those things work? How does the room have to be organized, and with what consequences? How are the slides organized? How does the diction and the, the flow of discourse depend upon, you know, bullet points and things like this? So there's been a lot of studies of PowerPoint, but very few of, of, as it turns out, of spreadsheets. Those that there have been of spreadsheets fall roughly into two categories. Um, the most common are studies of a spreadsheet error. And there's actually been a great body of work going back for 30 years um, on the kinds of errors people make in spreadsheets. 
Um, these are studies that for a long time were uh, sort of relatively obscure and nobody paid any attention to. But you know, sometimes they, they hit the front pages of the newspaper. Um, some of you might have seen the debates that have been going on and, um, about whether it is that austerity policies are justified by a, an academic paper which has a spreadsheet bug in it um, that actually missed a whole bunch of the data on which the calculations were being done and that actually showed that austerity policies had no effect at all. Um, it's a debate. Uh, the other set of studies have been on um, not so much on the errors that people make in spreadsheets, uh, but on the way spreadsheets work in organizations as sort of a store of memory. Um, and I'm going to come back to this a bit, a little bit later. But the idea is, you know, sp spreadsheets document information gathering and decision making in organizations in ways that we might, for instance, want to go back to and revisit. They become an organizational memory, but they also may be an organizational memory of how we did something. So that when we come to do it next time, we go back. You know, next time we're doing, you know, making our decisions about what summer interns we're going to admit, or next time we decide in my department what graduate students we're going to admit, we kind of go back to last year's spreadsheets to remind ourselves of the structure, clear out the spreadsheet, and start again. Um, so you know, so that, that's the sort of the second class of studies, um, but not so many that look at what we were discovering. Um, in the in the work at NASA, which are what we're calling spreadsheet events, um, that is the sort of the occasions of people coming together. And again, you know, and I just gave you some examples. These are things that we're all familiar with. You don't have to be flying a spacecraft around around Saturn in order to be familiar with, um, the, with the the spreadsheet event. We live in them all the time. They're program committee meetings. They're um, uh, yeah, you know, hiring okay, hiring events um, and so forth. In this particular case, they were. Um, in this particular case, uh, there are a variety of group of, of moments when a set of people is coming together, often to make fairly contentious decisions. Uh, the the starting point for for us was um, this particular case where. Uh, they were running out of fuel, and so they had to make a series of decisions about what sci which of the science projects they had planned to do on a particular part of, I don't know, the spacecraft was passing by Enceladus or something. So on their next pass of Enceladus, what things they were going to do, um, uh, and not everybody who was going to be able to get their, their science into the mission. Um, and so they came together in order to try to decide which parts of what had been planned were still possible under these more restricted circumstances. Um, and the deal was meant to be that all the spreadsheet cells would be colored by the end of the meeting, either red for no and green for go. Um, and they discussed the first one. And they can't quite come to a decision, so they decide to color it sort of yellow. Um, and then they get to the next one, and the next one, well, we still can't quite make a decision, but, but it's less likely than the last one, so, so maybe we'll make it orange. Um, and they end up the meeting with absolutely nothing is red and absolutely nothing is green, but everything is some like bizarre, indeterminate, muddy shade somewhere, somewhere in between. Um, and, and we just became fascinated by how it was that what Excel was able to do in terms of, for instance, repeating colors, which is an interesting sort of part of the process, um, allowed them to come up with a logic that described what they, what they did. Um, particularly interesting because, of course, you can't actually sort by color in Excel. You can group things by color, but you can't sort. There was no way to say these are better. See, I knew. Yeah, you can group, but you can't, you can't sort. Um, that's why I said it very, very carefully for this crowd, <laughs> this audience. So, so let me, I want to talk about this, and that question of sort of colors, for instance, and the kinds of things that can be done was what sort of cued us towards this notion of thinking about in terms of material constraints, mater forms and constraints that those forms offer. And that's what I want to try and talk about. And I want to talk about it in terms of um, sort of three, two or three, it was originally two, and then I added something. But um, I want to talk in terms of three broad headings. Um, Two of which are structural and one of which is not. That's why it doesn't quite work. But the two sort of structural things are sort of the grid and the formula. Um, and then I want to talk about trajectories. So the idea, of course, that grid and formula is being central to the form of spreadsheets goes back to um, you know, the, the origin story of spreadsheets. That's the sort of essence behind 
um, uh, Bricklin and Frankston's sort of invention, which wasn't really an invention, but rather was a way to appropriate what it was that um, Frankston had been learning at Harvard Business School and to create a, a structure um, whereby on the computer he could do what it was that he saw his accounting uh, professors do. And the center of that was to be able to have a grid that would across which um, uh, and, and within which data would be represented. And the important thing about the grid is the grid is you know unavoidable within the spreadsheet. A spreadsheet never begins blank. It always begins empty. And I think that's an, actually an important distinction. A spreadsheet is something that you fill up, um, but the structure, the idea that you fill it up in a way that is organized um, uh, in a two-dimensional grid is already given to you. There have been spreadsheets that don't operate purely in this manner or that sort of break things up a little more. And obviously there's, uh, you know, there's workbooks and the rest of it in various other ways that you can go beyond a simple grid. But the grid is fundamental and the grid is unavoidable. And what the grid does, of course, is that it also requires one to commit to a particular kind of granularity. The grid is not refactorable. Once you commit to what a cell is going to be, and then fill out the rest of the cells in accordance, it's very hard for you to come back and say, oh, that one thing I put in that cell, I want to make that be three cells now. Or those four things that I put in different kinds of places, they should be collapsed together. One can manipulate the grid in all sorts of ways. One can manipulate it you know, in terms of rows and columns. We can add, delete, reorder, the rest of it. One generally can't operate in terms of blocks, although again, it kind of depends on the particular feature that you want to try and use. But refactoring is, um, is, sort of, is not available to you. And this turns out, in, for instance, the meetings that we were looking at to be important. It means that once something's in the spreadsheet, and the spreadsheet is the thing that drives the meeting, there is no opportunity if one wants to actually have a successful meeting, which by and large people are committed to, especially when you've got a spacecraft flying around at tens of thousands of um, kilometers a second. Um, there's no opportunity for you to say, let's do this a different way. You're already committed to the structure that's there. You're already committed. So that granularity produces just by itself um, a commitment to stability uh, within, the, within the process. Um, that we might sort of think about that as well when we th think about those questions of how it is that we go back to spreadsheets and reuse them. The other thing that the, spread, the, the grid does within the context of these kinds of meeting is that it produces a structure of anticipation. It shows us what is going to happen. Um, it, we proceed by and large from top to bottom, or we proceed downwards and then upwards and then downwards again, or we proceed from left to right, we bounce around. But nonetheless, what the, stru the structure allows people to anticipate what it is that's going to happen next. Um, and of course, the grid, as we were saying with respect to colors, the grid defines and the granularity defines in what way order can be changed and what things can be reordered and what things can be um, uh, reprocessed. So the grid, just as an element in itself, creates, um, is the basis around which particular kinds of spreadsheet forms come into being. Um, obviously, I can do those in different ways, and different spreadsheets are going to have different ones. But the material around which this stuff is, is being organized comes to us from, from the grid. We found another tremendously important part of grid operation. Um, I ran out at some point of pictures of people standing in front of PowerPoints. This is this Excel. This is obviously not a spreadsheet, but it looks kind of like a spreadsheet, so just go with me on this one. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, uh, the, the other thing that was actually critical in the particular group that we were looking at was the way the grid produces both alignment and separation simultaneously. Let me explain what I mean by that. Um, as I said, the way this team was organized, uh, you know, there were different teams doing different kinds of science, all with instruments that are bolted to the same spacecraft. Um, 
when the spacecraft was originally designed, it was designed with a scan platform, so like an arm that was going to stick off from the side that was going to have lots of instruments mounted on a gimbal, and it would be very fluid and flexible and easy to, easy to point different kind of instruments at the planets or the rings or, or the moons as they, um, as, they, as they flew by. It was going to be really nice. But these were value engineered out of the design. That is, they ran out of money, and they had to do something different. So what they did was they bolted all the instruments directly to the spacecraft. Um, that was a way to save money, but it produces then this effect that um, the spacecraft has to be rotated or tumbled in space um, in order to change what instrument points in a particular kind of place. And fuel um, and reaction wheel wear are both very valuable commodities here, which means it's expensive to turn the spacecraft in space. What does that mean? That means that if your instrument is pointed at the planet and I would like to point my instrument on the planet and my instrument is on the other side of the spacecraft from yours, it a, it, you know, there's going to be a fight, basically, right? It's going to be an organizational struggle for me to make the case that the value I'm going to get by pointing my instrument at the, um, at the, space, at the planet and gathering my data is worth the cost of the fuel, reaction wheel, wear, and all the other kinds of things in order to be able to get that result. Um, there are something like 16 different instruments, so there are 16 different instrument teams, all of which are doing different kinds of science. Some of that science can be done quickly, some of it can be done slowly. The scientists don't necessarily publish in the same place, so they have all sorts of fights about that. Um, the gravitational team is continually getting beaten up by other people because they just need lots and, lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of measurements over years before they get one paper, um, whereas other guys are going, I don't know, I took a picture of a supernova, so yay. Um, you know, and, but that means that the supernova people or the, or the visual instrument people are continually saying to, for instance, the graphismetric people, it's like, no, there's no point us wasting fuel on your measurements because you guys haven't done enough science. So these are the kinds of terms in which battle lines are drawn, and fights develop. Spreadsheets play a really important role in then the point, moments when, these, when the groups have to come together to make decisions, contentious decisions, about resource allocation for resources like time, fuel, and reaction we all wear. And this issue of alignment and separation turned out, from, in our observations, to be very important. A spreadsheet, again, go with me, pretend it's a spreadsheet. A spreadsheet um, is, sets the structure of the meeting, and what normally happens is it's circulated amongst the various teams in advance of the meeting, each of whom fills out their column. Here are the particular properties of our observations, of what we want to do, here's how much it'll take, here's how much time we need, here's what, what the benefit, and so forth. Everybody fills that out separately, and then it's collated and comes in. So everyone has described their problems and, what, and their desires in the same kind of way, alignment. We're brought into alignment. My problems are the same kind of problems as your problems. They live alongside each other in the spreadsheet such that we can talk about them commensurably. And yet, we don't smoosh them together in a way that would eliminate the independence of my stuff from your stuff. I mean, you could imagine, oh, we'll just like combine these two things because they're basically the same or the instruments in the same place. No, 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 can't do that. Um, we need to be able to keep them separate. We need to be able to talk about the distinctiveness of different kinds of agendas and different kinds of needs. And I might need actually to be able to extract my stuff and put it into something else next time when we have this fight because we know we're going to have it again because you know we're flying around and around, we'll be back here. Um, and so, um, and so dis keeping things separated is actually really important. And that's what spreadsheets were doing for these guys, too. They hadn't simply smooshed everything together into a PowerPoint presentation that said, that's what these guys want to do, and that's what these guys want to do. The spreadsheet showed the alignment between different people's practices, but at the same time maintained a sort of independence for them. And grids are, the, the grid is a key feature here in relating sort of indep uh, um, independent but related elements and bringing them together. And I think that sort of balance between alignment and separation is, is key. Okay, so so much for the grid, for the moment at least. Let me talk a little bit about the second sort of component in this, which is um, the formula. So obviously, the formula that is, the kinds of things that we put into spreadsheets that are like produce calculations. The, for, uh, um, the formula is the thing that um, breaks the grid. It fits within the grid, but it produces more than grid-like structures. 
um, formulae contain mathematical operations or textual operations and references to other parts of the spreadsheet that sort of take it from a two-dimensional structure into something much more complicated. They also make it into something that's much more dynamic. Um, and uh, one of the things that's sort of intriguing, of course, is the fact that because spreadsheets deliberately try to treat primary data, that is just numbers that you enter or textual elements that you enter, um, and formulae, um, identically, one of the it, things that sort of comes to be an issue is how things move back and forth between those two. That is how it is that my, one might ever know what the structure of the spreadsheet is from moment to moment. Because there's no way for you to look at this spreadsheet and know what things are, um, uh, are original data and what things are uh, the results of formulae. You can't read off from the spreadsheet the structure that produces it. There's no way to tell, and that's sort of entirely, um, uh, entirely an intentional feature. Sorry, I'm forgetting which one my next slide is. So I, even though I can see it, but I need to like remember. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, yes. So there's no way that you can even see. Uh, you can, there's no way that you can see it, and this is of course intentional. Um, that is, you want in the particular moment of coming together to ignore the why of th what's on the table and just focus uh, focus in the what. Um, and yet, if we think that those questions of, for instance, separation and alignment are important, then so too must be the dynamics of what's going on how it came to be there, when it was produced, how it was put there, who put it there, and on the basis of what forms of decision making it got to be there. Um, and the, I mean, one of the things that becomes important here, of course, with respect to that issue of dynamics, there are questions of sort of, for instance, searchability. Uh, one of the things that characterizes digital documents, digital media in comparison to their paper counterparts is this idea that they are indexable, searchable, findable. And yet, if something is in my spreadsheet, not because it's a piece of basic data, but because it's a drive data, it's the result of a formula, it's not available to search processes. Certainly not outside of the spreadsheet. I can't search over my hard drive in order to find the documents that have a particular number in them if that number is not actually in them. If what's in them instead is a symbolic description of how it is a number would be produced here. It would be produced as soon as I open up the spreadsheet, but when I just look at what's on my hard drive, it's not there at all. Um, and this is, I think, this is interesting when we start to think about questions of organizational practice or around archiving. Now, the organizational practices around archiving is always kind of an interesting one. It's not an area of specialization of mine. And it's interesting because, and actually now I think about it, I ought to know what this is in Microsoft and I don't. Because, of course, like organizational retention policies often mean that archiving is not about archiving, but about deleting things, and mandatorily deleting things. Um, but, as, but, but when uh, in, in sort of, you know, the places I go and the uh, um, Conferences I go to, people are fascinated by and concerned about processes of moving large-scale document collections online. Um, one of the issues here is this one of searchability. And yet, searchability, indexability, um, turn out not to be features of the digital at all, but to be features of particular kinds of digital materials that don't necessarily spread themselves uniformly through, um, through the, the, the digital world. And which may not even, as this case of, um, of formulae, uh, um, show may not even be uniformly distributed within a document. Some of those cells are searchable and some of those cells are not. Some of those cells are going to be shown up on a, on a um, uh, you are going to be indexed in the archive on my hard drive and some are not. And I don't know which I do on this spreadsheet, but I wrote the spreadsheet. But, um, but people don't know which. And that matters in these cases like um, the ones in the in the in NASA, where the spreadsheet, although it's organizing, indexing, and anchoring a particular kind of event, is also going to be an archive. And as I said, some of the one of the areas of research that people have done already on spreadsheets in organizational science is on spreadsheets as archives of our they they archive our decisions. They also archive our processes. That is, the spreadsheet is a reminder of how we did things in the past that we might want to do in the future. And in fact, we certainly found in the NASA case 
trajectory really mattering? The thing about spreadsheets, nobody produces the spreadsheet in the meeting, right? You don't start with an empty, well, occasionally you do, but in these meetings you don't. You don't start with an empty grid and fill it out in the meeting. A spreadsheet comes into the meeting and it moves out of the meeting again. Um, it might move out of the meeting into an archive. It might move out of the meeting into the minutes. It might move out of the meeting to go to the next stage of the process. It might move out of the meeting to go to another set of people. It might move out of the meeting in order to circle back again next time. Um, but they circulate and they move. And because they circulate and they move, because they flow in and flow out, questions of what things are findable, archivable, are now on record or not, actually matter a lot to the people who are doing this, who are doing this work. Um, sorry, I'm trying to decide which way around to do a couple of things. Um, one of the things that certainly matters, for instance, is the sort of like the spreadsheet at various kinds of historical moments and your ability to be able to speak to particular versions of it. Because again, if they if imagine these things are not simply documents in the moment, but documents that flow, then the temporal um, aspects of that are really important. Um, and this question, as I said, of how we reuse spreadsheets in order to, uh, to re-perform organizational action um, um, comes to be entwined with formulae as well. After all, nothing that's on the spreadsheet has to be produced by the result of a formula. You could just have, especially in the spreadsheets we're looking at um, uh, at NASA, which don't contain complicated math by any means. There's lots of complicated math at NASA. None of it was going on in these meetings. Um, uh, well, not much. Um, but the, <laughs> the question is then, why is anything a formula? Well, it's, uh, something would only become a formula because you thought it might change in the future. You want to produce a particular kind of consistency when other things change in the future later on. It's a way of future-proofing the consistency of the organizational document. Um, so notions of, you know, the kind of abstraction that goes on as soon as you put a formula in is already speaking to an extent to um, this notion of trajectory, the notion of the way the spreadsheet is embedded in an organizational process and created an organizational context that gives it particular kinds of um, power and meaning. So, I mean, I've sort of been hinting at some of this, but one of the ways to recognize the particular materialities of spreadsheet form and to recognize how it is they become entwined with organizational practice and what it means for organizational practice, is to ask yourself the question, what would happen if instead of spreadsheet, the meeting was organized around another similar kind of thing? Doesn't have to be a spreadsheet, could be a photograph. Doesn't have to be a spreadsheet, could be a whiteboard. There's any number of things it could be. It could most obviously for a start be PowerPoint um, or I can say PowerPoint, I'm at Microsoft, I'm like a, a generic PowerPoint. It's actually in Knobloch's book, he only he uses PowerPoint with a capital P to refer, refer to the Microsoft project, and PowerPoint with a small P to refer to presentation software. Uh -huh. <laughs> These are actually keynote slides, who knew? Um, but, uh, but so it could, be, it could be PowerPoint, right? It could be presentation software. Why would presentation software not do the job for them? Well, by and large, for a start, it's not malleable. Um, it doesn't have the property of being able to be reworked on the fly in the, in the room. Um, you know, now I think about it, there's this other interesting feature with respect to PowerPoint and other things, which is what's on your screen is not the same as what's on my screen. I can see my notes, I can see what's coming up next, I can see a little timer. Um, actually, that distinction is, um, might actually be important with, res with respect to the process of producing agreement and alignment within a meeting. Um, actually, just earlier today, as we were going for lunch, I suddenly thought, damn, I should have... I should, be, I should be giving this presentation in Excel. It would be so much better. I don't know what it would mean to give it in Excel, and I'm gonna to have to try and figure that out before I next give this talk, but uh, I should be getting it in Excel, and then I could, yeah, never mind. I could be doing it on the fly. But we, when, those, when in those meetings people do make changes on the fly, they do it in a way that the screen is mirrored and, um, and everyone is in alignment and everyone is in agreement. Um, they could do things in a word processor, for sure. You know, those are malleable. Uh, you know, I think they just don't manage the scale, obviously. Um, and what's more, if you did things in the table in a word processor, you would not have this notion of the formula that produces consistency, produces, embeds fut futurity. We could do things on a whiteboard, obviously. 
But the thing about the things about the whiteboard is the whiteboard doesn't, you know, the results from the whiteboard don't feed in and out of meetings in quite such a good way. I can send around images of what happened on a, spread, in a, on a whiteboard, but I can't re go back there so that the next meeting is the result of pre prior work and so forth. So visuality is not enough here, nor is malleability. Um, the, there's something important here about the way it can be captured and circulated, moved and, and removed, um, uh, sent back, or reworked and brought back into the meeting. So if we want malleability then, why not a database? After all, lots of databases use a tabular structure. Lots of databases look even like spreadsheets in terms of their user interfaces if they have them. Well, I think the problem with databases is they're too malleable. And they don't have that property of version particularity that enabled what was going on in the meeting um, to become an organizational mandate. That is, I can't generally point you at a database and say, here's the database that says what we decided in that meeting because the data is, is continually a fluid thing. Other people can come in and change it. I can send you the slides, and those are definitely the slides, and everyone can look at them and say, that's definitely the set of slides, that, or the PowerPoint, the, sorry, the spreadsheet that came out of that meeting. Um, but when I send you a link to a database, I can't version the database generally and lock it and say, boom, that's the database as of exactly when we all walked out of the meeting and it will not change. Or you can always go back there no matter what else has changed. The database is in many ways too fluid. Even though what the spreadsheet is capturing is often database-ish, um, the database has a different series of materialities that make it not work for this particular kind of context. Not, again, that they don't have lots of kinds of databases. And even, I think, and this is perhaps, you know, for me, this is the most revealing one, um, even s some other kinds of spreadsheet forms don't work for this group. So, for instance, I've been in lots of meetings where what's on the screen, well, actually, so the first thing I want to do is go back very quickly to look at the slide. Um, not that one, that one. So here's an interesting thing. There's a spreadsheet on the screen, and everybody is also looking at the spreadsheet and I think it's the same spreadsheet on their laptops. Well, nearly everybody else on my screen, something else. Um, but these ones are also showing spreadsheets. But, they're, but we're looking at, people are looking at different parts of the spreadsheet. However, because of the structure of the meeting, what Knobloch calls the event, there's only one person who's able to make changes up here that are collective group changes. Only the person who's projecting their spreadsheet at the front of the room. Now, I go to lots of meetings there are spreadsheet events in Knobloch's sense in which the spreadsheet is a, uh, okay, how do I best, uh, well, I'll just say Google Doc, or I don't know what, I, what the Microsoft equivalent is, SharePoint or something or other, I don't know, a shared online cloud-based spreadsheet. Um, and that doesn't work for them either, because if this were a cloud-based document, these people could be doing all sorts of shit down here. Oops, all sorts of things down here. Um, while that, per while, you know, maybe in um, changing things in anticipation of getting to their part on using like the arguments that have been used before to say, oh, well, maybe we should realign this, do something slightly different. Um, maybe they're like updating things on the base that we've already discussed, whatever. The thing, is, the thing about the, the um, laptop-based spreadsheet, the non, the offline spreadsheet, is that it um, provides a certain sort of point of control that makes sure that there's only one spreadsheet that is the object of record and that everybody knows what that is and everybody's in agreement with it. If the object of the meeting is to produce alignment and coordination, then I need the document form to have properties that insist upon convergence. Uh, convergence of conversation, convergence of decision making, and convergence of document. Um, and the online versions don't do that. The, the movement of locus of control or the distribution of locus of control um, um, means that it's not well aligned with what it is that they need to do. So, so spreadsheets um, uh, are, you'll form one of the, there's a series of case studies that around which this sort of the book is organized and the broad question of materialities of information is the sort of central topic. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, as I said at the beginning, it's like there's lots of ways into the materialities of information and many of the ways that talk about it sort of focus on a contrast with the um, ineffable and material untouchable stuff of the virtual and attempt simply to say, no, the digital is material. Look, it has shape. It demands power. 
It consumes natural resources. It has to be in a place. Somebody has to be in control of it. And I sort of want to try and go beyond talking about materiality in that sort of general way and saying, look, it's actually material, to start to ask the question, what kinds of materialities does it have? What kinds of specific properties characterize digital forms, digital representations, in ways that condition, shape, evoke, produce, restrict, constrain our actions? Properties like their granularity, properties like robustness, translucence, portability, weight, heft, um, um, you know, dynamism, and so forth. And then to be able to sort of identify those within different kinds of representational forms um, and draw out from that through examples like this one with, um, with uh, the, the scientists at NASA, what the relationship to practice might be. How is it that particular kinds of forms of practice evolve and co-evolve with, with those material forms? Not being um, entirely constrained by, but, um, but springing, or by being shaped by, and recognizing too that then as designers, we are people who put those things back into the, back into the tools. So there's a series of cases that I sort of work through. I've given you um, the one on spreadsheets. Um, there's one on emulation, there's one on internet, pro actually there's two on internet protocols, um, there's one on, on SQL and NoSQL databases. And the property that these cases turn out to have, not by design I should say, although I'll claim it if I have to, um, but is that they sort of operate at different kinds of scales. Um, scales of action and scales of, sort of, pra scales of, of, of practice um, and scales of reach. Um, and they also sort of enroll different kinds of disciplines. So the, the stuff I've been talking about today um, speaks largely to sort of organizational science and organizational ethnography, whereas this stuff on internet protocol speaks a little more to like, you know, network and telecoms governance and um, policy and so forth. So they, they tend to operate at different kinds of scales. And I think that's, uh, that turns out for me to be um, you know, one of the, the lessons of this stuff is the idea that that kind of argument about materialities can, um, has this power to operate across scales as well as across different, different kinds of sort of disciplinary boundaries, but the scale one, scale one in particular. Um, I already said that one. So I just sort of, you know, and that scalar thing is kind of, is for me kind of important. So over the last 10-ish um, years, uh, there has emerged at some you know, intersection of computer science and information science and critical social science and the humanities, a sort of interest in, in software objects and software as texts and in what has become sort of known as software studies. And bringing sort of critical analysis and, and humanistic analysis to, um, to digital objects in particular to, to software systems. Um, but the work there has sort of gone in many different directions. Some of it, uh, explores the, um, what do I want to say, sort of the, the rhetorical amplifications of software. And so, I don't know, there's a whole, you can buy whole books on people studying poetry written in Perl or pseudo Perl. Um, don't ever actually try to execute any of the Perl. God. Um, whereas on the other hand, you know, some people have sort of reacted to that and say, well, you know, the digital has actually sort of disappeared from that if all you care about is like, you know, the, torch the tortured, um, uh, tortured syntax of, of hash, bang, and at signs. Um, we need to sort of get back to the real things, and so then there's a whole sort of counter movement within software studies called platform studies, uh, with the, the ur text of which, which actually is a fabulous book, but is you know a study, a very precise study of that you know the um, timing considerations in writing software for the Atari 2600 VCS um, and how it is you would have to like, you know, grapple with the hardware in order to produce an effective game. And arguably that book, although published by MIT Press and, and you know, written by, um, written by digital media scholars, is more advanced documentation of the Atari, operation of the Atari VCS than Atari ever gave to its developers. Um, what I'm trying to do in this work is find a sort of middle ground there to turn questions of architecture and representation 
um, into topics for software studies, to do it in a way that doesn't sort of read the sof software and technology as metaphorical um, or the basis for metaphorical flights of fancy, but as something that we have to sort of take seriously, as something that is sort of phenomenologically present to many of us as we use computer systems and to, and as, you know, to try to find a sort of new point of leverage for trying to, trying to do this, this work. Um, and so hopefully I've managed to give you some kind of sense of that today, but I think we have some time for questions. Yeah, thanks. So I'll start with two quick tangentially related bits of trivia, then I'll make a oh, semi-snarky comment, which will segue into my actual question. <laughs> <laughs> Can you like hold up fingers so we know what stage we're at? <laughs> Oh, uh, so the first is, if, it, if anyone hasn't seen Peter Norvig's PowerPoint presentation of the Gettysburg Address, Google it. Yep. <laughs> Second is, I learned very recently that Roman numerals can do fractions, and uh -huh. that's even crazier. Uh -huh. My semi-snarky comment is, um, when, you were, when you were talking about the muddy colors in the, in the NASA thing, um, I don't see that as, as, I see that as a positive outcome of the meeting, because it's you know, two minutes work to add a column called priority, number the colors, sort by that, and you've got an ordered list of, you know, what you need to do. Okay. So my question is, from your talk, I infer that you actually think spreadsheets are a good idea. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, and also what would you recommend to improve them? Um, okay. Let's see, which order am I going to take things in? I, let's see. I mean, with respect to sort of the second half of all of that, um, I also think that the production of various forms of muddiness um, was a positive outcome in the, in the meeting. Um, the spacecraft still flies. Um, there were no blood was spilled. Um, so, you know, to that extent, and decisions were made, they, so they sort of did it. Um, it is actually entirely possible that if the properties of the medium that they were using had constrained them purely to reds and greens, the outcome might have been much less pleasant for all concerned. Maybe just as effective, but much less pleasant. And pleasantness in a project that's lasted many decades and will last many more is important. Um, so I actually think that's fine. Um, but I am not so sure that if they had then chosen to assign color numbers to those, to list them from one to ten, um, and then sort by them or whatever, that it would have been nearly as um, pleasant's not quite the right word, but uh, it would have been a lot more fractious, I suspect. Um, I think what's nice about the colors is the very ambiguity that they provide that allows for a certain amount of interoperation and good goodwill. Um, Whereas I think if it had become one to ten, then it would be like, no, that's not a six. It's more of an eight. You know, it's like you know, and you start to get, like, and you know that they would have gone to six and a half. You just know they would have gone to six and a half. So, um, uh, so I think um, I'm actually I think that it's important. What's important here for me is actually the ambiguity that the, that the representation can provide. Now, of course, in one sense, it's absolutely unambiguous. It is a color. It's a precise. Um, set of like, you know, RGB values or however it is that, that, that Excel stores color. Um, but at the same time, within the, purpose, for the, for the, within the frame of the meeting, it would be, um, it would have been less effective. And it remained, because it, no, it, the ambiguity would have, was effective. And that's why I don't want to then sort of start to give design recommendations for um, the next generation of spreadsheets. Because I think um, the point here is not the spreadsheet by itself worked better or worse. The interesting thing is this set of people evolved a way of working that incorporated the constraints um, and, uh, and properties of the medium that they were using. They would have managed somehow to struggle through with other kinds of things too. I'm more interested in how it is that the particular constraint produced for them in that moment a workable solution. Um, in other kinds of meetings, completely different strategies might have to have been applied. Uh, where, uh, you know, so, so it's not to say that this one is better or worse, but I'm kind of interested in that sort of interfunctioning of practice and form that the, that, that example provides. Um, it, as 
an example of that, I think it would be really interesting to study the way that startup culture is changing with the introduction of Slack and the movement from email and shared online documents to like this running shared conversation. Yeah. And I, I've just, I sort of experienced that a little bit myself and I think it's, it would be really interesting. I think that's right. I, so I think, of course, we've seen a sort of a, a variety of, um, of sort of like historical, historical moves there. But, you know, I used to be at Xerox Park, and John C. Lee Brown, who was the director of Park at the time, used to like argue way back. You know, the great thing about email and organizations is it's so informal. And um, kids today, you know, kids today um, encounter email as this dreadfully formal way in which they interact with institutions. Nobody ever actually sends them an email except their professor, the um, you know, or to tell them that they're late paying their fees. Um, <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, so there's this, these, the interesting thing then is like not simply the way that the, that the medium operates in itself, but how it operates in relationship to all the other kinds of things and how we read it as having certain kinds of organizational or, or other functions. So, yeah, I hadn't actually thought of doing the Slack stuff. Um, and I don't know why I haven't, um, I haven't actually even heard of anybody else doing it, but it would be really interesting to look at for sure. No. Um. Maybe there's a point of clarification about, it seems like the way you talked about spreadsheets is more as process and as something that's sort of a collaborative, live, um, living document. Have you also been looking at it as output? So something that another separate software program spits out or mm -hmm. save as Excel file. And, and sort of the, the act of, of that creation being somewhat in the hands of the person executing that, but also in the hands of the product itself. Um. No. Uh, so let's see. So yes, I have been talking, I've been talking about sort of process in particular, uh, you know, I'm talking more about these spreadsheet events rather than spreadsheets and how it is the spreadsheet event is, sh is I don't want to say shaped by, but you know, is, um, is entwined, with, uh, entwined with representational form. It's clear that spreadsheets do a lot of other work within organizations. And some of the work that I sort of like, you know, briefly wave my hands at in the talk, and I can point you to references, particularly by a woman called Elena Cacciatore, um, has been studying sort of documents uh, or spreadsheets as, as, as objects that are, um, you know, archived, used, reused, and again, a lot of this stuff that goes along with sort of Martha Feldman's work on the re evolution of routines, how it is that spreadsheets sort of act as an organizational memory. And I think then you'd start to see some of that stuff, um, the kind of th things that also sort of speak to where the spreadsheet goes after the, af after the meeting. Um, the idea that the spreadsheet is also something of a universal form, that it can be um, output by planning tools, that it can be output by other kinds of things is, um, it's sort of part of that question of circulation. Um, one could say the same again about PowerPoint and other kinds of things. Uh, but, um, but it's not been something I've been looking at because I haven't, it's like, I've been using spreadsheets as an example to get at the materialities rather than thinking about spreadsheets in, 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 in total. Now you talked about the, the advantages of, of having the sort of the spreadsheet file that you send around, which is not the model of Google Docs or Office 365. Um, there, there seems to be some advantages to the other model too, which is that you know you don't have to have someone who receives all the spreadsheets and then merges this together and then sends it back in. And, uh, can, can you talk about how you might combine those without losing that that uh, rigidity that you actually kind of want in a meeting like that? Um, well, I mean, again, I think it's I think it's really interesting because I think you know the example you give of why it would be advantageous to be able to sort of do this stuff online is it would save somebody the work of um, of integrating, and yet I'm pretty sure that in a lot of organizational practices, somebody really, really, really wants that work, not just the work, but they would like to be in control of that. Yeah. And it's like you know, there's a reason you might want to volunteer to be the scribe for any, for any, for any meeting and all, the, all those kinds of things. And I don't mean that in a Machiavellian way. I mean, I mean, you might even say that there's some people who are better at hearing in a fractious meeting the different kinds of positions that are expressed and, and, and being able to then sort of do something that's representative. So I don't want to frame that absolutely as work. I have a feeling that if um, people, you know, if, if, I, if we were having a series of meetings that were anchored by an online document, Office 365 or whatever, that allowed you know, simultaneous updates, we would find a different way of working. It's not that the whole damn thing would like fall to pieces. Um, um, it's that we would have to work differently. They have a way of working which is indexed by the 
properties and constraints of the form that they are using. I have, you know, and and I think, you know, there are certain things we could sort of call out and point to and say, look, here's how that feature is playing into what they're doing, and here's where they're getting some benefit from this, and this is what allows them to proceed unproblematically at this moment because of the, because of this feature. It's not to say that's the only way they could do it, because they could certainly do it otherwise, um, and and I'm sure they have. I'm sure they did when you know, they weren't all like, I mean, again, this is a project that started in the 1980s. I don't think they were all coming around in the 1980s with like Excel on their laptops and sort of presenting this stuff, I'm guessing. And yet the project has continued. So I think, it, I think the relationship is slightly different here between what they're doing and, and the other stuff. Dave. So um, you talked about uh, the difference of trying to do this with a database and its fluidity and such. But what about something like Microsoft Access? That's a database, right? Um, it seems a lot more like Excel than you were making out. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, Is it still different? I mean, I could, you could imagine, I could imagine ways in which they could make use of that. I don't spend a lot of time using Access myself, so I'm not, I'm, I, I'm not speaking from a position of deep, deep knowledge. Um, one could, I can, you can imagine spreadsheety ways of using databases, just as you can imagine databasey ways of using spreadsheets. And some, in some ways, they're closer together, and in some ways, they're further apart. At some moments, they're closer together. Um, maybe that would work for them, and that's just fine. Um, I, it's not clear to me. I, but on the other hand, I think one of the things that Excel has that. Um, that access doesn't is it's pretty much on everybody's laptop. I don't I, you know, I don't have access on mine. And it's inter, you know it's it, it sort of it's it more of a uh, of a conventional form. It may go to some of the things that Merrill was saying about how it is that spreadsheets interfunction with other kinds of um, uh, applications and so forth. Um, but you're you're absolutely right. When I was saying database, I was meaning more you know I, you know the the online database that's stuck in you know that's in some place or even in fact you know maybe some of the um, you know, file maker -y kind of things, which is more in this sort of access place. But I think, it, again, it, this stuff, I think it tends to be about, um, and, and the stuff we were seeing, tends to be about fine detail within the structure of the organizational document or the digital document, rather than, oh, spreadsheets generically do this and, 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 and databases generically do that. Um, I may have spoken more like spreadsheets do this and databases do that, but what I want to sort of draw attention to are the sort of way in which specific forms were um, incorporated into a sort of an evolving organizational practice for these guys. I asked a question because I wanted to understand more about what you're saying about the fluidity of databases. Uh, like, it's not, maybe you're saying that like Google Spreadsheets is too fluid, uh, even though it's a spreadsheet, and Access might not be fluid, even though it's a database. I think it's about identity conditions um, on on these things, particularly as file. I mean, and in this case, it's not so much about spreadsheets as about files. The thing about a spreadsheet is you save it to a file. The file has a particular kind of identity. It sits on my hard drive. It's got a particular kind of name. It has particular you know, properties. And that allows me to go, oh, yes, that is the one that I had on the screen. And so yeah, so it's, it's, it, here, here it's like how the thing inter, interacts with the file system that might be, that might be more. That's actually useful. Yeah. Thank you. I, I wonder if I want to have you come back to why something like a spreadsheet ends up in a place like this as part of an event like this. Because I feel like I'm hearing a couple, so like one read is the different options have different formal structures. One works better for a certain practice. Another one could be, um, you know, they've been doing this since the 80s and the thing was sitting there and the institution had a big partnership with Microsoft and, you know, it's on everyone's laptop. You can imagine a kind of Slack related argument that says something was rejected because this looks better, and so it was taken up. Um, uh, or, or maybe a kind of like a politics of, right? Someone wants to hold on to the position that this tool lets them stay in, like the person who collates. So, like, how do you think about those? Or do you think there's something that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, I think it's a great question, and I would love to have had the opportunity to find out more about that. And actually, if I talk with, um, so. Um, Janet Bertezzi did a lot of the, was one of the um, ethnographers who was like, um, uh, doing a lot of the work on this project, and she might have more insight given her sort of long-term uh, um, relationship with, with NASA and, and, and space science projects. Um, I would be fascinated to know where that comes from. Was there once upon a time um, a setting in which they sat with, with, with printed out tables 
um, and and you know wave them at each other. And, but, um, but even even not but, knowing this case, could, do you think of this as something like spreadsheets and other things have formal qualities? People take them up, use them, or t people use them despite them. Um, and they're therefore sort of stuck. Well, I mean, I think it's, I think there's always going to be a bit of both of those, right? So, so it certainly has to be the case that this has to, or these people are not using in general in this in these kinds of meetings bespoke tools. They have tools for the job. They, there is plenty of like you know bespoke tools that design pointing arrangements for the spacecraft and things like that. But in these meetings, you're running a bulk standard. Windows laptop with with all the standard software on it, and so it's going to be something that the stand that's standard stuff, um, and so so obviously you need to fit your task to um, uh, to 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 things that are you know roughly roughly um, available available to people. Um, I mean, one of the things that I do find fascinating about this, in some ways, is there is almost no of of all the things you would find in the papers on the errors people make with spreadsheets, for example, you're not going to find any of that going on here. There's no formulas. These are basically just lists and tables. And in fact, they're often, in many ways, just slides. Um, um, they're just slides we can edit and, and put things in, put things in boxes. Um, and, and so there's, they're making so little use of what we think of as the spreadsheet properties that that's actually one of the things that makes it interesting to me. All that stuff, all the like, you know, oh, you can now play what if that is the central part of advertising for VisiCalc in like, you know, 1982. None of that's in here. None of that's, none of that's relevant. Um, I actually myself was doing a program committee, I mean, years ago and sat down with my, with my co-chair and we were just making a list. And so naturally she breaks out Excel and I'm like, what? And it's like, you know, that's just our list making tool. Um, and it, as it is for many people. Um, Bonnie Nardi actually has a really interesting paper from years ago thinking about the questions of when and when people make decisions to adopt special to adopt specialized tools versus using generic things and it's like you know actually sort of pre powerpoints and like why yeah you can I just use my word processor and then it, you know I print things out onto acetates it was a paper from a long ago um, um, and I think that's one of the interesting things here is like you know well these people are clearly capable of building a specialized thing but they don't so they're making very generic use of this stuff but I think actually it's just common availability is a very important it's a very important part um, they don't need a lot but then what's there does, I think, start to sort of shape and push things in different kinds of directions. Maybe not intentionally. We're 10 minutes past time, so I kind of think we should take it out to the hall where we have delicious treats, and you'll be around to answer further questions. I will. All right, thank you. All right, thank you.